much better mic for the second half, which is great. That means my voice will probably hold out a little better also. So we've set up the problem. We learned something about how to think about future carbon emissions. We look at the world and we say, this is a huge challenge. The planet isn't very big. The emissions are growing. Uh, the headroom is being filled. There's many, many parts of the world where there's people aspiring to live with much greater emissions. Maybe the emissions in the developed world have plateaued. They certainly haven't elsewhere. I do not have the answers. The second half of the talk is about options, but it is certainly not about what we should do. We will collectively contribute to figuring out what we should do. Um, I'm saying this is one of the largest problems that has ever faced humanity. And it's not very many degrees of separation away from combustion. In fact, it's intimately connected to combustion. So in th the three general topics in this part of the talk, the wedge model, which I will explain, the abundance of fossil fuels, and then specific stabilization wedges. Just out of curiosity, how many of you are familiar with the idea of wages? Not too many. Good. Because that's a paper I wrote in 2004 mm -hmm. with Steve McCullough. We got kind of a lot of attention, but it's in a different set of courses from yours. It's in, so I will explain it to you. Um, just this was our this was one of our slides from last from the first lecture. Just to remind ourselves, we're talking about finding some way to limit the total carbon dioxide emissions over all people and all times. Uh, that we have 30 billion, that we're adding 1% per year to this bathtub and it's growing at a half a percent per year. We're talking about four to five tons of CO2 per person. We got our bearings from that. So I'll introduce this idea that uh, this way of talking about emissions uh, that Steve Bacala and I wrote in the paper in Science in 2004, which became, which was useful because we introduced a physical unit, two physical units that hadn't really been part of the conversation before. And I can do this quite quickly, given all of what we've been talking about so far. Um, and there's, by the way, a second paper in Scientific American in 2006 with essentially the same content, but uh, describing the situation a little bit differently, uh, more, with more gra better graphics and some new ideas. So let's go back to tons of carbon dioxide per year, global. There's the magic number 30 for around now or a few years ago. Looking back in time to 1950 at the reference point, five times less emissions, uh, a lower emissions rate. This is the, in my grown up years, we have changed this system from one that was not a very big perturbation on the planet to one that is a pretty big perturbation on the planet and it's growing. So your grown up years, I'm about 50 years older than and so I look at you and I look at a 50 year interval where you will be talking to a group of students 50 years from now and what story will you be telling them about all of this? And I ask you to imagine that. The 50 year interval is a very interesting interval. It's the interval of a career. It's the interval of a planning horizon of a company that expects to stay in business. It's the interval of, of much land use planning build a bridge, maybe expect it to last a little longer than 50 years, but you might not uh, build a building. It's, it's a time period of an awful lot of stuff. So we looked at, we had all that right hand space on this graph is to ask two questions, is to, is to make you think about two questions. The first question is, if we do nothing about climate change, we decide as a collective species that it's just not very interesting or it's too hard, what will our missions be 50 years from now? And there is a large literature called forecasting, econometrics, fitting curves from the past, extrapolating to the future, deciding on how much new technology there'll be, how powerful a competitor renewable energy or nuclear energy will be, an outcome of probably a thousand papers with answers of all sorts. So that 50 years out, there's some cloud of points or line of points, which is the emissions in 50 years. Nobody knows the answer, but people speculate. The second question is, if we really do care about climate change, what are credible emissions 50 years from today that we should be, what's, what's in an emissions level 50 years from now that you should be proud to have achieved? Good deal lower than where we're heading, how much lower? Uh, what kind of target 50 years from today should we establish? Because we're concerned. 
there is, again, a thousand papers, different kinds of people writing such papers, people coming from the environmental sciences, talking about changes in meteorology and hydrology, uh, people um, generally worrying about other kinds of impacts. But it's coming from damage forward. And, and so what Steve and I did in 2004 was to draw two lines, cutting through the fog in both cases, and saying that, you know, doubling today's rate of emissions in 50 years is approximately where we're heading. That's 1.4% compounded, 2% linear over a 50-year period. An awful lot of papers have higher numbers or lower numbers, but it's kind of in that ballpark. On the other hand, if we want to achieve something, Holding emissions constant at today's rate, 50 for 50 uh, in 50 years, whether you go up and down, or but having a goal of no more emissions in 50 years than today is a pretty tough goal, and one should be pleased if one got to that point. I sometimes say I would endow, I will endow a party, which you're allowed to throw, you guys, at your 50th reunion of this event, provided emissions are no greater than today. Okay. Otherwise, the party, the, we have to decide what happens to the money otherwise. Um, very importantly, in that graph, there is an orange line that comes down. Because emissions at the, today's rate in 50 years does not come close to stabilizing the climate. The CO2 will keep growing. Uh, the sinks are not as large as that. So you would have to break this into a kind of a 100-year plan where the first 50 years we get the problem under control to the extent of keeping stable, getting to the same stabilization emissions level, and then further cut in the following 50 years to get to the point where our emissions equal to sinks. So this is a simple way of thinking about it in two 50-year segments. So we put this forward, and people uh, found it helpful because we were cutting through all that, all those internal arguments, and we gave a name to that triangle. We called it the stabilization triangle. Um, and then we did something else. We broke that triangle into pieces, such that, uh, <coughs> and we gave the name wedge to those elements of that triangle, the units of that triangle. And we gave, and we defined the vertical axis in 50 years um, that defined one wedge to be roughly 4 billion tons of carbon dioxide per year not emitted because of something we do, a wedge of nuclear power, a wedge of coal, more efficient coal plants, a wedge of more efficient vehicles, a wedge of biofuel. Uh, how big was that? By, by a wedge, we meant a comparison of two futures, just as you see there. 20, 50 years from now, that much carbon will not be emitted because of something you did relative to something else you did. And that gave a quantitative uh, that gave a quantitative vocabulary to the discussion of climate change. And we got kind of a lot of attention. It's a highly cited paper. Um, to let you in on a little secret, the size of the wedge, vertic the vertical size is 1 billion tons of carbon per year, not carbon dioxide. So it's close to 4 billion tons of carbon dioxide. The ratio is 44 twelfths, right? 16 for oxygen, 12 for carbon. So it's a 3.7. And rounding off in carbon dioxide units is close to 4 billion tons of carbon dioxide. I'll call it that here. In our paper, we call it a billion tons of carbon per year. So a wedge, well, I think I have a graph. A wedge is a strategy to reduce carbon emissions that grows in 50 years from 0 to 4 billion tons of carbon dioxide per year. It has to be credible that it could happen to be on our list. And our paper presented a list of wedges saying that, and we had a list that was larger than seven or eight or nine, and we said, you've got some choices. You could do this or that. And people found it exciting that they could then talk about, well, a wedge of photovoltaics is a whole lot of stuff. Wedges of photovoltaics instead of coal, we always to say instead of. Uh, and we could, um, and there became a quantitative discussion, <coughs> as well as a sense that, that you couldn't do the whole job with one strategy, so you need a wedge of this and a wedge of that. And all of that came out of this, uh, sort of was born with, the, with this image, with that image. Um, if it's going to be four, tons of CO, 4 billion tons of CO2 per year not emitted in 50 years, and if it's a triangle, that is 100 billion tons of carbon dioxide. 
imagine there's a market for it, a typical price might be $60, in which case it's a $6 trillion enterprise that is we're talking about. We're talking about the energy, that helps you understand how large the energy system today is, it's, and therefore over 50 years, it's in the hundreds of billions of dollars, 50 year campaigns are in the trillions of dollars, that's a lot of activity. Needless to say, it's a lot of jobs for engineers. Um, and that is the story that we're then talking about. So I'm going to present options in the wedges language. It gives us a certain amount of capacity to make comparisons. So you can clump wedges in many different ways. Uh, this is an example where energy efficiency at 12 o'clock means all the ways in which we can have a future that is more efficient than the one we're heading for by deliberate attention. We sort of say, if we take climate change, we wouldn't do it if we weren't taking climate change seriously, but we do, and then this happens. But when you're comparing two futures, obviously there's a lot of arbitrariness, but the whole category called energy efficiency. And then, to, then we, se we separate electricity and fuel at 2 o'clock and 4 o'clock. Today, 40% of global emissions of CO2 are from power. 60% are not. So it's a big divide. And so we can talk about electric power production and decarbonizing that, and separately decarbonizing fuels for vehicles and for houses <coughs> and other things, um, and, and see where that takes us. It's not quite that simple, because at 6 o'clock, you see that, well, electricity can invade the fuels world, as it does with a hybrid car fuels can invade the electricity world too, but we want to particularly pay attention to the electricity invading fuels. If you look at that 40% number and track it through time, a, a larger and larger, the world is getting more electrified relative to other ways of using energy. Just percent of emissions or raw, car, raw energy data that are from electricity is going steadily up. The world is electrifying. Electric vehicles will, will move in that general, in that same general direction. Electric heat pumps replacing gas furnaces another one at 6 o'clock. At 8 o'clock, I want to mention that this carbon that we're talking about, we've been talking fossil carbon mostly until now. But the biocarbon on the planet is just in the, if you burn, if you burn a piece of wood, you can't tell the carbon dioxide, exception looking carbon-14, you can't tell the carbon dioxide from the carbon dioxide from burning natural gas. You don't look at ice. So, um, and the isotopes have nothing to do with the greenhouse problem. They do the same whether it's carbon-14 or carbon-12, right? So um, you have a whole story of how does biological carbon, how do biological carbon, fossil carbon, interact as we go forward? There's roughly as much carbon in the plant life above ground as there is in the atmosphere. And then we're so you have a very large carbon reservoir available. If we want to just take the land and turn it entirely into a source of fuels, shut down the coal and gas world, we would have enough carbon, but we may be using it for anything else. We use the land for anything else. But biocarbon will compete with fossil carbon in a very complicated way that we don't want to lose track of, and I'm flagging that at the data. When we cut down forests, we add to the CO2 in the atmosphere. Why a major push that has got lots of friends is to, is to persuade countries, pay countries, not to burn their, not to cut down their forests, for climate change reasons as well as for uh, biodiversity reasons. And then countries that own the forests are saying, maybe we will. Uh, how much are you going to pay? And that's one of the things I heard about a lot in Rio. And at 10 o'clock, we have my reminder that it's not only, not only is it not only about fossil carbon, but about biocarbon, but it's not only about carbon dioxide, it's about other greenhouse gases, other than methane, and so ways in which we might get wedges from methane could also be under discussion. I will not be discussing them today, but can we actually, methane as methane, not as burning CO2, but leaks of methane might be fixed, and there might be a whole wedge there. I'm not sure there is, but it is. Um, so various, at the time that Steve McCall and I wrote the paper, we had seven wedges. I just wrote something last fall and there were nine wedges. The size of a wedge is a billion tons of carbon a year. 
And if you look at that table of data over here, rounding off, this is the, these are the emissions of fossil energy carbon, carbon dioxide only. And at the time that we were writing the paper, we were talk, rounding this number off to seven because we were writing this with the last data that was available. Um, the time I wrote this paper last October, this was the last number available, it rounded off to nine. So we went from the same paper written last year would have had nine wedges instead of seven. And the number is a good deal higher than this. Today it's about 9.3. I saw a number for 2010, but it still be nine wedges. So that the, and if you look at that curve, you see that the total emissions of fossil energy are being divided here into five pieces, through only three of which are substantial. This is oil. Yellow is oil and blue is coal, which have had an interesting dance where, where oil became the dominant fuel. In the last couple of years, coals through the particularly Chinese coal power plants have, has passed oil again, measured in carbon dioxide units, not energy units. Whereas natural gas is playing a kind of a third a third role, about half as big as the other two. If natural gas turns out to be much more abundant than we first thought, it's quite possible that the line will come and catch up with the blue and the yellow one. I've seen forecasts that suggest that that could happen. And this particular database, maintained at Oak Ridge, includes two other things. The cement industry also emits CO2 because it takes car calcium carbonate out of the ground and turns it into lime, which is calcium oxide. So it produces a carbon dioxide source independent of fossil fuel, which is a few percent of the total fossil. And then this last line is the flaring of natural gas uh, at, at oil production. It's not a very big term, but it's of course something that is, amounts to an economic waste. So I want you to get a sense of what kinds of data are actually around. Um, I want to make a point about wedges that if you look, at, when I'm talking about comparing two futures, a future where we don't care about climate change, this one, where we do care about climate change is that one. Well, there's another line, which is we don't care about climate change, and we don't do anything that is actually points in the right direction for other reasons. If we bring on nuclear power and wind for reasons that have nothing to do with climate change, we move from this line to this line. The purple line is an energy emissions that are proportional to global gross national product. And in fact, in all, all of the forecasting of where we're going in 50 years without attention to climate change, there's an expectation that the world will continually decarbonize, meaning that the ratio lower its carbon intensity without attention to climate change. Um, if you look closely at a forecast of emissions that doubles the emissions in 50 years, there's a lot of wind. There's a lot of nuclear power. There's a lot of efficient cars. And so the green is over and above what you do for uh, that what happens without attention to climate change still more happens. And so we were criticized, we said this in our paper, I want to make it really clear. There is already, there is already wind turbines in, in, the, in the black line there. And so this would be additional wind turbines. But different people put different low carbon technologies in here. A nuclear enthusiast may put a lot of nuclear power, a wind enthusiast may put a lot of wind. And so whatever it is that you've gotten there, it's over and above that. Now, let's just go back to that Let's start with that. So eight years later, we've had a lot of criticism of this paper. And mostly, it has been to say that we've made the problem look easier than it is. This is an enormous effort. But people have said, we will more than it. We will emit more than double if we don't pay attention. And the earliest the data of the last eight years have been above that black line. The recession has pulled it down toward the black line, but I think it's still over, over that black line. So we've got a bigger problem of adjustment than that. Maybe so, maybe not. I'm still comfortable with that line, but there's evidence that we, I mean, it's the, almost all the arguments have been you're underestimating. Uh, the other <coughs> argument, and more severe and better, much better known, is that we shouldn't throw a party if we only have the same emissions. We have to do better. And the world in the period since that paper has tended to focus on a global emissions of 50% of today's emissions as the proper goal for a party. The world should emit half the carbon dioxide of what it does today. 
These are connected with the models that we were talking about before, these emissions trajectories with temperature rise. You saw how, how wide an error bar there is for connecting emissions to temperature rise. But if you take the central value of those emissions, what we drew is considered a three degree trajectory, which means the world's surface temperature will rise about three degrees with a big error bar if we have that kind of trajectory. Um, and, the, and there was a great focus in the last few years on two degrees max emissions, which might look like that and then down like that. Um, and so we are regarded as selling dangerous medicine, not good enough to solve the problem. I have going to leave it at, at the picture that I've drawn, because I personally believe if we get to three degrees, we should throw a party and then a very limited group of people because the people either say this isn't a serious problem at all, what the hell are you talking about and why are you wasting students' time on it, or it's so severe that you mustn't allow anything like the same emissions in 50 years as today. And what I want to show you is the reason why I'm not willing to take that last. So that picture shows um, what I call the interim goal, the tough interim goal, and the tougher still interim goal. Uh, Okay? And um, if I ask what's the real difference, try to think about this curve. I told you the developing world and the developed world make, have equal emissions today, and they roughly are in tons of carbon, which is where this side of the American picture came from. Roughly three and a half billion tons of carbon each in 20, in that starting point, three and a half billion tons each developing and developed countries. Now just a portion, the, the new numbers for 50 years from now, any way you like, and something like this picture is pretty highly constrained, that if we double emissions, developing countries will emit, both will grow, developing countries will emit more. We multiply the left one, the developing country emissions by 2.4 and the developed country emissions by 1.6 to get those two red lines. If you say emissions are constant in 50 years and you want to leave room for developing country growth, well, we went down 60% and up 60%. And I would argue that you can't get very far from those numbers to be credible anyway. If you now change the goal for the developed world, for the world, to have 50% emissions in 50 years instead of the same as today, if you take that all out of the developed, and you say the developing world, the developed world doesn't cut any further, the developing world looks extremely different between some growth and actually shrinking in the developing world. So a 50% emissions means everybody cuts dramatically. And although this is the official statement that's down 60%, down 40%. That's the official goal of a large part of the diplomatic discussion to date. The developing countries are really not part of that goal. So developed countries have told the developing countries what we need to do without really having a conversation. And so I think it's very problematic. It could be done. Two degrees may be the right objective, but if it is, we're not only talking about the developing countries being decarbonizing while they grow, but decarbonizing radically while they grow, while all of this activity goes on in the developed countries. So these images of two and three degrees, you should have in your head, because that is what the, those who care about climate change say we should be trying to accomplish. But they're part of the reason why the world is recoiling from them, because they're so ambitious, especially the two degrees problem. So in certain circles, if you don't say two degrees, you're regarded as some kind of heretic. And if you, other, others, if you say three degrees, you're regarded as some kind of uh, zealot, far too ambitious. That's the state of affairs today, in my view. But what I make, so one question people ask about the climate change is, look, we know where there's all this discussion of running out of oil. There's only so much in Saudi Arabia, even. Won't this carbon dioxide problem be solved by depletion? There won't be enough hydrocarbons in the ground to get the atmosphere into trouble. Would that that were true, but it's not. And so I want to give you a little sense of how people who talk about how much buried hydrocarbon is there, uh, what kinds of numbers they come up with. Okay, so um, let's go ahead. just to have in mind today's energy emissions are 50%, or sorry, 80% fossil fuel. When you measure primary energy, I'm talking about the, the energy use that was 10 to the minus 4 of the sunlight, 
we burn fossil energy. We tend to count here nuclear power and hydropower, and then wind, the newcomers, wind and PV, geothermal, which are all pretty small. Uh, we count the energy. That's what we call primary energy. When you do that, and some biofuel, uh, when you do that, about 80% of the energy is associated with coal, oil, and gas. And here is that if you add up the white rect three leftmost right, the three leftmost rectangles, white rectangles, they add up to 80% of the total of all the white rectangles. And then here's the International Energy Agency again, showing you uh, what might happen in 50 years. They're very bullish about renewables. They, in fact, double. The increments are nonetheless are across the board, and the percent goes down to about 75 in 2035. So we're getting out away from fossil fuels, but slowly. Well, that's, that's just an orientation. Um, so we better pay attention to fossil fuels. Let's make sure we understand what a fossil fuel is. It's the result of photosynthesis a long time ago. A long time ago, this upper result, with the help of some sunlight, carbon dioxide and water vapor were both absorbed in a leaf or some other organism and made a cellulose and released oxygen. And almost all of that went in the reverse direction to bring the atmosphere back to where it was. Um, it, and at that time, there was a respirator. Some microbe ate the leaf, and the carbon dioxide that was taken in by the leaf was returned to the atmosphere. But a little bit didn't get pushed back the other direction. It got covered in mud, the leaf. The organism never got a shot at it. Shot at it. And so we have hundreds of millions of years of not quite balanced uh, uh, photosynthesis and respiration that, we are, that has taken the form of accumulations of coal, oil, and gas in the ground. That's the resource, the stored energy from millions of years ago's photosynthesis that we are consuming when we're consuming fossil fuels. So we're talking about buried carbon in reduced form. There's lots of carbon in carbonate rock. That doesn't count. That's an oxidizer. Buried carbon in reduced form. And of course, it isn't just cellulose. There's additional reactions that happen that drive the oxygen out so that most of what's underground doesn't have the oxygen molecule attached. It's hydrocarbons. It's various ratios of carbon to hydrogen. And notably, carbon to hydrogen ratio for our three kinds of gases, for our three kinds of fossil fuels, natural gas, oil, and coal, are importantly different. And you really must appreciate the importance of the carbon to hydrogen ratio when we're discussing fossil fuels. For natural gas, which is methane, it's four hydrogens to a carbon. For oil, think, think iso-octane, 18, 18 hydrogens with eight carbons. It's a roughly two to one ratio of hydrogen to carbon instead of four to one. When you get to coal, it's typically less than one to one. It's like 0.8 to one, 0.8 hydrogens to a carbon. It depends on the coal. So the amount of hydrogen per carbon is very different when you go from coal to oil to natural gas. And that means that you can, from that awareness, you can understand that the CO2 release per energy release as you go from one fuel to another is very different. If you burn because you're getting energy from oxidizing the carbon and from oxidizing the hydrogen. Carbon to CO2, hydrogen to water vapor. So when you have a lot of hydrogen running along with the carbon, you get extra energy out per unit of carbon dioxide generated. Natural gas is more favorable than oil, which is more favorable than coal, in terms of getting energy out without so much carbon dioxide. So if you have a carbon dioxide price, what's going to happen to the competition between natural gas and coal, which will be advantaged? power plants, for example. The natural gas will be advantaged because the coal is putting out more CO2 for the same kilowatt hour that's coming out of the power plant than the natural gas is. So the natural gas industry is not as, is often holds back from opposing carbon policy because it wants to be, it's mostly competing with coal, not with, not with wind. Coal is its big, its big competitor. If this technology, if carbon policy helps, natural gas vis-a-vis -vis coal. It tends to be quiet in the discussions in Washington or somewhere else. The coal industry is really, really sees that, that carbon policy is, is, is going to hurt them, unless they do various things. 
So this ratio, that rightmost column, is something I really want to make sure you understand, because it explains so much of what goes on. The hydrogen rides along with the carbon, producing its own <coughs> energy. Roughly, you can sum the emissions of those two of those two atoms separately, and you can get the total. Of course, it's not quite that simple. Some of you, I hope, I'm sure have played with some of these. Uh, uh, and enthalpy and Gibbs free energy numbers that are here. But we go back to, we keep our eye now on the question of running out of stuff. And let's talk about what we hear most about is running out of oil. So here today, we the units, I, could, I, I didn't give you, I, I think I'll, I'll have a chance to say more about units. There are lots of energy units, completely convertible to one another. The US uses British thermal units, the British don't for heat. The U.S. uses, uses um, sorry, so, that, so there's a heat unit, BTUs versus calories. There's an energy unit where we would use foot pounds and the, uh, and the rest of the world uses joules. So there's those four, two work units and two heat units, dating from before people understood that work and heat were the same, or versions of the same thing. Scientists have picked one unit out of all of them, the joule, and say, that's it, guys. That everything's to be measured in joules. And they impose a discipline among scientists, but not when you start talking about national accounts or industry uses and so forth. And another unit uh, would be units related to the oil, gas, and coal industry. This is not a, a barrel of oil is a unit of volume, 42 gallons. There's another unit called the barrel of oil equivalent, or the ton of oil equivalent, which means the, which is an energy unit it has its cold equivalent. And that means that the, the, uh, it's the energy you would get if you burn the stuff precisely to find. So here's a volume unit. The oil industry uses barrels a day and a million barrels a day. And the world is producing about 80, 80 plus, 83, 80, something between around 85 maybe, million barrels a day of oil today all over the world, various, what's being pulled out of the ground. Uh, there's always some complexity that one has to, it's already there in that picture. There's a piece of that oil which isn't coming from oil fields, coming from gas fields. When you bring the gas up, there's a condensing liquid that's in there, which is like C5 to C7. Uh, and that um, becomes a liquid when it comes out of the ground. And you see that that's the orange path. It's a pretty substantial fraction, and sometimes excluded. But the blue curve is the interesting one. It's depletion. The oil fields today are not going to be able to keep producing the same amount of oil that they do today. And so, um, in fact, in, in they, their decay time is startlingly fast, as you see. So we would run out of oil quickly if we didn't find more. The oil fields today are going to be producing less than half in just 20 something years. Um, so there is confidence, nonetheless, in the oil industry that they will be able to keep producing oil and a little bit of an increment to the tune of about 100 million barrels a day as a target. And then you get arguments about whether it's going to be 90 or 110 and that sort of thing. Just want you to see that picture. And notably, that there's a, a need for more oil because of the fact that the, where it's being extracted, the oil fields don't have a finite lifetime. You invest in them, you get a certain amount. I took this picture uh, of one of the things that's coming on as an oil substitute, conventional oil substitute, called the tar sands. It's an enormous uh, resource of very hydrocarbon uh, in the form of, of tar. It's called oil sands if you like it, and tar sands if you don't. And this is in <laughs> northern Canada, uh, in Alberta state, where there is, and this picture too, these incredibly large concentrations of buried carbon in the form of oil impregnated rock. You boil this stuff, you heat this stuff, the oil comes out. The oil needs more refining after that. But this, this particular formation, about 15% of the weight is actually a hydrocarbon. The rest of it is sand. Um, and these are some of the largest pieces of mechanical equipment in the world for doing that. Heavy oil, this is called, and this that big brown circle is the, uh, uh, the tar sand of, of northern Canada. The second biggest one is, is in Venezuela. There are obviously quite a few. You get a sense that there's a lot of oil that goes of a, of, a of a stage, not as convenient as an oil well where liquids come straight up, but with additional processing out it comes. As far as the national 
or the world, as far as the world economy is concerned, it's additional processing, but not a whole lot of additional processing. And out will come gasoline or diesel or jet fuel or whatever. Um, so here's a curve, one of a few that you can find by intrepid people who try to estimate how much oil there is um, of various kinds. So it turns out, very there wasn't any celebration, but the billionth, sorry, the trillionth barrel of oil was pulled out of the ground not, in, in not that many years ago. And, uh, and we are now on our, beginning our second trillion uh, barrel of oil. So here's the produce. And then they have laid, lined this up in a funny way to the right. But first of all, they go all the way out to 9 billion barrels. We are only one ninth of the way through by this particular version. Hardly running out. But on the other hand, if we think about only these two, you would say we're about a third of the way through. MENA means Middle East and North Africa, essentially the OPEC oil. This is everybody else's oil. By this particular view, we're one third of the way through. We're not far from the peak if we were talking about conventional oil only. On the other hand, here comes the heavy oil. Here comes oil shales, which are, which are, which are related. They're rock, they're, they're rock where the oil is even more uh, tightly uh, between those two, uh, this is more in, these are shales and these are sands, but it's the same idea of, of oil trapped in rock that you can release by heating it. In, in between here, you have something very important for our discussion, which is EOR, which stands for Enhanced Oil Recovery, getting more oil out of those existing oil fields by, by flushing them with particular uh, solvents that bring the additional oil out of the field. When you produce an oil field, you leave a lot behind. One of the most important solvents used for getting additional oil out of an oil field is carbon dioxide. The very molecule which we're trying to keep out of the atmosphere is actually a useful molecule in oil fields, which has all kinds of implications, as you can imagine. And then we can actually take gas or coal and the other versions of, of hydrocarbon and make liquid fuels from it. And that's a huge part of your story. And you take, what is a gas, what is a coal to liquids plant look like? How much of that will go on on the planet in your world up years? How much gas to liquids? There's an enormous gas to liquids plant right now in Gutter in the Middle East, owned by Shell, about to put on the market, a, it's one of the largest capital facilities anywhere in the world, it's about to put a lot of oil into play. The Gutter didn't see how to get economic value from a huge gas field on the largest in the world, and decided it would turn it into liquids. Coal is being turned into liquids uh, in a couple of plants in China. It's a, it, was, it was developed in Germany and then in South Africa. Coal to liquids is another approach to getting additional liquids. Coal to liquids puts lots of additional carbon dioxide into the atmosphere because you're going to have carbon dioxide left over as you deal with this carbon to hydrogen ratio if you think it through. So that about twice as much carbon dioxide goes into the atmosphere from mile of driving as if gasoline came from coal compared to coming from crude oil. So coal to liquids is, may give you additional fossil energy to keep driving cars, but it's not what you would like to see from a climate perspective. Imagine a fossil energy era, ERA, that was based on today's conventional oil, about a billion tons, and you get a little curve like that. This is a world of that where we actually put we take 5,600 tons, a billion tons of carbon out of the ground. It's larger than the oil I showed you a moment ago by some. This might be a better image of, a, of the oil era or the fossil energy era. It's not going to last forever, but it could, it could quite credibly last uh, with a, uh, into the, into the 2300. Say if that's a 300 year era, 150 years to the peak. From the point of view of your careers, you're still on the rise, on the rising part. It's not forever, but so. But if this is the kind of a number we can think of for paying no attention to carbon, getting that reduced carbon out of the ground, uh, it's 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 worth thinking about what some of those numbers are. This again is in billion tons of carbon versus carbon dioxide, so we're at about nine right now. It peaks at only three times our present consumption, um, but it goes on a long time. 
long enough, and I think that's my next curve, to same curve, to bring about a uh, almost 2,000 parts per million CO2 in the atmosphere. That is, so depletion is not, if that could happen, because there's enough buried carbon to do it, you can see that you're not going to get, you're going to get a climate that you don't want to see that will bring on Lord knows what if you're 2,000 parts per million. Um, that comes about by just, and it comes about when? It comes about in 2150. That's a time period that's a little hard to think about. But that's the world in which we pay no attention. Just enjoy the very hydrocarbon we have and pay no attention to climate. Question? Yeah, well, that's why you Toxic meaning to just breathing the air and getting yeah. sick? Yeah. It's a good question. Um, that's 2,000 parts per million is two, is two tenths of a percent. Yeah. That isn't <coughs> toxic. That isn't toxic. Um, something like 30% is fatal um, and it screws up the whole biological response. The, there is a number of which the submarines and the astronauts are kept below, which I think is something like 2,000 people. We don't get the right answer from public health questions to how much we can tolerate. It's that CO2 molecule reflecting sunlight, uh, reflecting infrared radiation, absorbing and degrading infrared radiation. That is what it's doing, not creating unhealthy air. And I had a debate with it, one of these climate deniers where he was actually saying, look, here are the submarine rules. We're nowhere near that. Don't worry about this stuff. So I mean, it's, it, you get a number. From looking at submarine manage CO2 management or spacecraft CO2 management, and I think it must be up around this place, but they don't let it go. It's way safe, way safe, way below any physical physiological pressure. Okay, so I hope I have persuaded you that depletion will not solve this problem for us. In spite of all this attention to peak oil, which would make a lot of lay folk think, hey, we're all this is over. This is over all by itself. The fossil energy era is over all by itself. We can relax. Um, how well are these numbers defined? How well are, what are the geology? Do they come from geologic geology? They're soft. You can find discussions of whether how long it will be before China is dealing with coal constraints or, the, or we are. And these numbers are relevant. Um, you don't want to come away thinking all large, all carbon. Fossil energy numbers, resource numbers are large. There are issues of depletion all over the place. But in aggregate, I think it's quite uh, unfortunately true that, that, that we will not, well, I don't want to say that either because it's very, that we have abundant hydrocarbons is awfully, awfully good in terms of global growth. But we have, um, a, we are not going to get out of this problem because of depletion. So we introduced this wedge you saw a while ago. And then we named them. We put them in various categories. And I'm not going to go through this picture, except for a very, this was another division. This was the one we used in my paper. We had 15 wedges. They're each a different kind of thing. Uh, quite a few of which I'm going to talk about in the next few minutes. And inside of America, now we noticed that that was never meant to be a complete list. And we didn't discuss in our paper uh, more efficient oil and coal extraction or natural gas distribution that would save carbon in one future relative to another. Or improved factory, and improved efficiency in steel plants. This first one is improved efficiency in steel plants. The second, more efficient, more efficient energy sources. Nor did we, uh, we describe some renewable energy sources, but not solar thermal. I will mention what that is in a few minutes. We didn't talk about methane at all. And we didn't bring about population. I, know, I think you could argue that how many people we have in by way of policy, by way of true deliberate choice, uh, could be very different. Let me show you a slide about that at the end. And there's a wedge there, at least. And nobody's saying to the maximum one wedge, you get onto the list if you can produce one wedge, but maybe you can produce three wedges if it's your power, or, or some of them are limited, or wind, or something else. We didn't include things that looked like they were not for this half century. Fusion might play a role in, in the global energy system, but we're saying essentially, not in the 2050, 2060, 930 period that I'm talking about for the rest of this lecture. Another idea is taking CO2 out of the atmosphere, bringing it out. Well, we're, it's 
instead of putting it in, having it CO2 flow over a chemical absorbent like sodium hydroxide, it does work at some cost. CO2 is very dilute. The plants are going to be very big, so maybe someday we'll be doing it. Or when we deliberately build forests, make forests bigger, we put CO2 out, take CO2 out of the atmosphere. Or we make power with plants and capture the CO2. We'll talk about that from, from, that, from leaves and from trees. And that there are ways of doing that, but they too, in my view, this is controversial, aren't in this half century because there's so much to do that it's cheaper. There are people who are telling us now that this is, in fact, much more imminent than, than a colleague of mine and I who written a report on this uh, believe that this is a controversy. Uh, this but if you, have, if you have the notes, you can look at the words that go with the size of a wedge in that Science American article. That's where they are. Um, very small print. So let's talk about specific wages in some categories of decentralized versus centralized. So decentralized is about vehicles and buildings. Um, if we take vehicles, we look at this picture. And what do you see? Look at that picture, what do you see? If you let your mind run, you can see many different things. Who wants to, who can, who has, wants to share something that What do you think about it? Look at that picture. So driving a long way. Yeah. Driving a long way. Connecting distances, quite, quite far distances, relatively much more easily than once upon a time. Connectedness across the country. What else? in the east, but that's where most of the people are. But you're, you're seeing something that isn't in the uniform, uniform area. What else, I don't know, what else do you think about? It's sort of what does this lead you to think of? Maintenance. Maintenance, OK. That, that's something we built. First of all, we think, we think in, pa in the past. This happened over about a 50-year period. Here's our 50 years again. This was Eisenhower who announced it, president from 52 to 60. About 50 years ago, we went and built this. Most of it already done. But there's going to be a long-term maintenance issue. We're going to be building, we're going to be fixing this stuff. More than we're going to be building it more than we'll be fixing. It kind of finished. It's kind of a certain plan finished. It's more sort of a picture of the past rather than it's going to double the number of lines. So you think about history and maintenance, construction and maintenance. What other things do people think about? Think about more cars. Um, yeah, people will cars and preference to uh, what? There's certainly growth in cars. Does this, this has an effect in another transportation modal competition that you might think about? Yeah. We're moving goods in trucks instead of rail in no small part because we built this. It makes possible movement of goods in trucks. Um, some people would see sprawl. That's, that, uh, this enabled, well, maybe not that, maybe that's not. We that certainly see highways impacts on cities, coming through them, coming around them, a lot of city planning. Some people would see air pollution. There's a lot of carbon monoxide and nitrogen oxide in that picture. Some people would see carbon dioxide emissions. Some people would see suburbanization, because as you go to the car, you're able to commute more and so forth. And I'm sure we could get many other words out of this. But this is a 50-year achievement, 50-year achievement, which, is a, which has accompanied a large, this is part of our lifestyle, very deliberate, very elaborate policy. But I must say, one other way to think about this is we were able to commit ourselves to a, global, to a national program that we sustained over lots of years, driven by the government. And today, I wonder if we, if we hadn't built this system and we're starting about building it in this 50-year period, whether we can get in a frame of mind to do it. We seem to be not thinking that way. Um, when we talk about other networks or other infrastructure, we're much more reluctant to build the infrastructure to connect the country than we were once upon a time. So there's some kind of ambition in this picture that we might not have. When we think about the frontier for energy efficiency in vehicles, 
or, and particularly low carbon vehicles, there are at least two pictures that come to mind. A very efficient vehicle, and here's then the electrification of vehicles. There's a Prius on the left. And biofuels, in this case, sugarcane bio, sugar ethanol on the right, both of which are part of the low carbon future for transport. We think about efficient energy conversion, combustion drivetrain aerodynamics and rolling resistance. Don't we ignore aerodynamics and rolling resistance when you're thinking about, although that's not combustion, that's part of the story of efficient vehicles. Primary sources for traditional fuels, where we, that's what we were talking about a moment ago, and the non-traditional fuels. Compressed natural gas may turn out to be a very important fuel if natural gas is as great as if the news about natural gas is newfound abundance through, sh through shale gas turns out to be really not hype, we might be looking, you might be looking in terms of a more, much more use of natural gas directly in vehicles or gas to liquid as part of the future of the energy system. The new, the new, the new entry to the discussion has been of shale gas in the last few years. And then, of course, the way in which electrification is going to affect vehicles is part of that story. When we go back from the vehicle up and up a level to the system, we think about public versus private transport. How is that going to play out? And we think about one of the things that I find especially intriguing is to what extent can information technology take the place of traveling in the first place? People are working from home. Video conferences are, are, are allowing businesses not to send their executives in airplanes quite as much. What are the limits? What, to what extent are we not doing more of that because uh, the IT hasn't gotten far enough? I try to test this. I try to give lectures by video, video uh, conferencing. Um, so with my colleagues, the technology has improved year after year, noticeably. I can now just have to go to a, a studio. Now I can use, I can sit at my desk with my laptop. And the kind of the bandwidth is sufficient, and the technology is there. The capability at the other end of the, at the other end of the conversation, businesses will tell you that they're using substituting IT for business travel more and more. Uh, how much is that, how big a deal is that? I think it's probably a very big deal. And it's one of the things you want to be having a look out for uh, on this and learn something about. And what, what trips can't be substituted for tonight? And why? Could I, could we have all stayed home in 200 locations and I could be talking to you on a screen and you'll be watching it? What would be lost? Maybe very little of my communication with you or something but a huge amount in terms of your brushing, your talking with each other. Um, one cartoon. When we retire, I want to watch travel videos. <laughs> we think that's a little funny, um, but it gets to the heart of the question. Can we uh, find complete substitution for travel in travel <laughs> videos? How many of you would like to visit in your lifetime. And I actually think you will. And most of your, more than, well over half. Or how many of you can you imagine, of those who raised their hand, that a, can you imagine a video experience well better than you could do today, more 3D, maybe more, more sound effects, that would get you a visual trip to the pyramids? And to, of those who raised their hand, how many can imagine that that would substitute well enough A single hand. So we have obvious limits, and the fact that half of you want to go see the pyramids, and so do half of any other board. And the pyramids, pretty crowded place over there, is some of the reason why we have this moment. Why do you want to see the pyramids? Big smelly. I went there too, I had a great time. Um, <laughs> transportation efficiency wedges. Now let's get to putting numbers. <laughs> And um, so we started that. This goes to work pretty quick past the midpoint. Okay. Um, our vehicle that we talked about before uh, is the vehicle that goes, our reference vehicle will be 16,000 kilometers at 8 liters. Not quite the same numbers, but it still gives you four tons of CO2. That's a nice reference car. There'll be about 2 billion vehicles on the planet in 2060. They're about just short of 1 billion now. Some people might say that's numbers even low, but let's say 2 billion cars. 
if those cars are today's average cars, which is what we're putting in there, which is like 30 miles a gallon and 10,000 miles of driving, they will, they will put 8 billion tons of CO2 into the atmosphere. If I want an efficiency wedge, I have, I double the fuel time. If I want a land use wedge, a commuting wedge, a transport use wedge, I have, I cut in half the number of kilometers driven. Either one will give me a wedge. All the vehicles, one wedge, by taking a, a credible baseline of a future set of future personal transport, and that's two times what a wedge is worth, and get a whole wedge by either doubling the fuel economy or having the distance driven. And what about doing both at once? Have the fuel economy, double the fuel economy and have the distance driven. Is that two wedges? That would be saying no carbon emissions at all. This is an example of interference of two wedges each one of them cutting out 50%, but done together, cutting out three quarters, right? It's one and a half wages if we do both. That kind of interference is all over the subject. Can you hear? Is there an issue with Can hear. Have an issue with? About take back? Yeah, where if you increase fuel efficiency. They'll drive longer. Yes, there is an issue. There is an issue, and I think, frankly, it's way overrated, but people say if I have more money in my pocket because I'm, got a more, I'm not spending as much money on gasoline, I will drive further. Yes, I will. But not very much further, I suspect. Not twice as far. Or will take that flight to Egypt. I might take the flight to Egypt. Or I might buy a camera, which will use very little part of it while I enjoy, while I spend a lot of money. So the issue of what we do, and we can't just add them up simple-mindedly, but it's a good first start. We turn to power, and we think about decentralized use. We think about end uses of electricity. That's a variable speed drive motor, which is the motors, all, a large fraction of electricity gets used in motors. Middle picture is a cogeneration plant, making heat and electricity and having a heat of value to the user, because I located a food processing plant or, a, or a, 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 some other use of low temperature, medium temperature heat uh, at that place, maybe a paper mill. Um, unlikely, that's usually out in the, in the woods somewhere. But some kind of chemical plant that needs medium temperature heat is located it's alongside the power plant, so we use both, and the compact fluorescent light. Those are examples. And importantly, something I'd like you to, you may not know, if I ask, if I sit at a power plant and look at the wires leading it and say, where are they going? Where is this kilo, where are these kilowatt hours consumed? The answer is 70% in building. 30% in fact, in the US. In the world, it's about 60, 40, growing towards 70, 30. The electrification shows up that way. So a building has the other end of a wire. In that building, there may be an appliance, there may be a lighting, there may be a computer, there may be a heating and ventilating system. But for the most part, we build power plants to, to, to furnish buildings, to create amenities indoors. You can pretty much equate the two. And you see that here because the three yellow rectangles are the where the electricity ended up. And roughly in equal thirds, but actually the four, the four sister third is the industrial part. In, and about equally in residential and commercial buildings, houses versus stores. Commercial is a whole wide category from stores to hospitals, government buildings, um, schools, and so on. This is a commercial building. Um, <coughs> Okay, so, so everything about an efficient building is going to reduce electricity emissions. And it's the largest untapped source of efficiency opportunity. Where do they come, where does that intersect combustion? Well, it's the efficiency of the combustion if it's local combustion. Uh, that's not the electricity side, it's the fossil energy side. Or the air conditioner, which is electricity using a more efficient air conditioner. That's a heat pump cycle that's not quite combustion, but it's quite a near neighbor to you heat exchangers and, and uh, working fluids and so forth. There's a frontier of energy efficiency, which is technology. And energy efficiency in buildings is an enormous, is an enormous opportunity for wedges. Um, and you see, by the way, transport at, at relative magnitude there, about 30% of the total. This is US data. 
I'm going to skip these two. I want to keep making sure we don't run out. But it turns out that we are now using no more energy year by year as we have in the past. You know, I'm going to go back. OK, so the, this is electric, electricity use in the country year by year, percent change relative to the year before. And it jiggles a lot. But in the 1960s and 70s, when I kind of entered this field, there was a rule of thumb that electricity in the United States grew 7% per year, doubled every decade. That was just a fact. Couldn't get around it. We just had to provide the energy. That meant we had to build an enormous number of power plants every year. This was the religion when I started in this field. A lot of us said, wait a minute, that can't be right. There's no natural law. There's no physical law that says you have to double in 50 years, double in 10 years. And a lot of work was done on energy efficiency, and prices went up. And the percent per year number for today is, as you see there, more like 1% than 7. OK. Um, the United States is not using a lot more electricity each year than the year before. Now, the, So that's the yellow data. To the left of 2006, it's historical data. And to the right of 2006, it's imaginary data. It, all the jiggles are artistic license. This is not data. This is just a curve that looks like the other one. And then there's a curve fit. This is all done by the internet, by the Energy Information Agency of the United States, which is a um, which is the place which keeps US energy data. It's the data source of the government and the Department of Energy. And they drew this curve fit through the data, which is a pretty good curve. It looks pretty close. It has the feature that it doubled, it, it, halves, it halves the growth rate every 20 years. You can see that it's 8% here, 4% 20 years later, 2% 20 years after that. Um, so that's a curve fit. It has an interesting feature, this curve fit, which is what? If, it, if we look at it going into the future, what is it? What is built into that curve fit? It never. It never. Never reaches zero. It never reaches zero, which in turn means that carbon dioxide, that that electric power production in the United States, never peaks. Never peaks. The US government does not want to bring into its consciousness that we might have a peak of electric power production. To be annoying, I drew a line without any curse, without any statistical effort that also fits the data pretty well, but has a different characteristic. <laughs> because electricity does peak in around now. And as far as I know, it looks as good a fit. I don't know if I'm right or wrong, but I want to expand consciousness by saying it's quite credible that quite a few variables in a developed country that measure throughput of material goods, in this case, electricity production, it could be oil use, really could peak because we get better at efficiency relative to production. And I, actually, what I spent some time on this yesterday was to been asking somebody in an audience to do this for me, and I finally did it myself yesterday. Is there about four more data points since that graph was drawn? And two of them over here are negative. Now, there was a recession, but the, they, they, sort of, they sort of fit more clo closer to that line, as I kind of thought they would. We haven't been, maybe it'll all go away and they'll come back to be positive again when we pull out of our recession, but we have an awful lot of efficiency in the system. And uh, we're getting rid of our most, our, our most inefficient coal power plants in favor of more efficient natural gas plants, combined cycle plants. So it really is, there is no reason to believe that we cannot, that we, we're putting, we, we can prosper on the other side of the peak. We wealthier countries, um, both in oil consumption and electric power consumption. We're producing about, 20, we use about 20 million barrels a day. We could, that could be the maximum we ever use. And the government in that very sort of the core of the data center of the country doesn't allow in the idea that we have. I'm talking about our capacity to imagine. 
And I think that's actually quite significant. Let me go on to centralized conductivity. Here's another map. I, meant to, I mean for you to think back to the highway map and compare the two. What is this a map of? It's nowhere near as familiar to you. But it's the electric power plants of the country today. It's coded by size, the size of the circle, and by fuel. The red, are, the red circles are coal plants. The yellow are nuclear plants. The nuclear plants in the Appalachia kind of can't enter a region which has been captured by the coal plants. It reminds me of the Go game, the Japanese game of Go, and the fact that you have a territory captured by the coal plants. You see it that way, too, I think. That's kind of interesting. You have, of course, hydro up in the northwest. You have a lot of natural gas plants in various parts of the south. Um, and you have a few renewable plants. This is the geyser uh, ge uh, geothermal plant in California. But it's overwhelmingly uh, fossil energy. But that's an interesting picture. I could play the same Rorschach test with you. What do you see when you look at that? You see 50 years of history. You see maintenance. You see urbanization. You see concentration in, in, in certain regions of certain fuels. Particularly interested in, in adding one more dimension that is not on this picture, uh, which is which is um, cohort or generation. How when were these built? When did they come online? And that's what this picture shows, and it's a startling picture again. Neither of these pictures is well known to most of you, I think, and yet they're central to thinking about the future of the electric power system and therefore combustion. Uh, here you have. Um, the, red is, the red are the dark red. It's not quite the same color. It isn't the same color, but are the, maybe it is, are the uh, fossil energy plants, coal plants. The natural gas plants are in, well, the dark red and light red, right? So this is, this is the natural gas, the light red. The dark red, almost brown, is coal. Um, oil was built up pretty much gone, uh, not much around. But there's some old coal plants. And then you have the nuclear in yellow. The main point is most of the construction is about 40 years old. Um, some considerably older than that. Really very little power plant construction in the United States in the last 20 years, except for this remarkable phenomenon. And this curve cuts off in 2005. There isn't a lot of construction in that following five years, except in renewables. But I wish I had the lip up to date picture. This flip was an excitement about natural gas 10 years ago. And it looked like it was very cheap, and everyone ran out and built natural gas power plants. And then they discovered that electricity price, natural gas price went up when so, many, so much demand for natural gas occurred. And in fact, they weren't competitive. So a lot of this is sitting around ready to burn natural gas that's going to come online now before we go to building new natural gas power plants. But if I leave that part of the story out, we're looking at 40 and 50 year old power. Nuclear, a little younger than coal. But most of our building, most of our power plants, old enough that if you look at historical data, they would be turned over. Typical power plant life, if you look at, go back 20 years, what, was, what age were they replaced? It was about 40 years. Now, in point of fact, in the United States, the whole effort of the coal power world is to keep their coal power plants running past 40 years to 50 to 60. And exactly the same thing is going on with the nuclear plants. The whole, the whole economic driver is to keep them running rather than replacing them. Uh, plant life extension for the nuclear plants, getting permission to run from 40 years to 60 years, a process which is nearly complete with plants being new licensed to go for 60 years. The original license was for 40. And so the maintenance issue that was brought up for, for highway is a major one here. What are we talking about? terms of grandfathering against pollution control laws, you know, the retirement, uh, relicensing, retrofit, repowering, all of these words. For the United States, if we're going to need no more kilowatt hours than we now use, and if we retire nothing, what follows? We build nothing. We call this the dean of the faculty's problem, which would be if you have a faculty of fixed size and no retirements, what follows? No hiring. So the, the, uh, 
Joan Avery, I'm a professor at UCF Berkeley. Uh, so the story of developed country power is about whether how to, how and when to phase out these current plants. And there is one combustion story after another about whether uh, about that that drives this answer. What are the alternatives and how cheap are they? If you're at home, a coal power plant, what's going to make you decide to put it out of business and build another coal plant or something? So bear in mind that with all of the interest in new technology, and we are building to a limited extent renewable power plants and a few natural gas power plants at this time. Unless we retire and we don't have the demand, we, we will build, we will invent the technology, but we won't build the power plants. This is not the story for a developing country with much rising demand, very few older power plants. Uh, they're just building a building stock for the first time. It's important to realize how different the story is, for example, in China versus the US in this particular picture. So let's talk about coal electricity wages. And um, let's see how much I want to get done. I'm going to have to make some choices. Um, Is it strict 530 cutoff or should we go to 540? Who's in charge? Am I in charge? Can we go to 540? Is anything in the way? If we do, then I'll do it. Okay, we'll go to 540. Is there anybody? Tell me if there's anything I should know. Okay, we'll go to 540. Um, so let's pick a future coal power plant. Now we're talking about not today's, we're not talking, now we're sitting in 2062. There are coal power plants which are our reference power plants. They are much better than today's power plants. They have a 90% capacity factor, meaning they're running 90% of the time. They have a 50% efficiency. Today's are low 40s. Um, and then those numbers, it will turn out that 6 660 grams of CO2 per kilowatt hour Today's reference number for coal plants is 1,000, a kilogram per kilowatt hour of CO2. So a third of the group, because they're really good plants. And those are the plants that we're going to talk about not building, because they build something else. So it turns out 700 of those, 700 gigawatts, a gigawatt is a million kilowatt, kilowatts, and that is the standard size of a coal power plant today, roughly. So we've got 700 of them that we're not going to build because we're doing something else. And then we can sort out various coal power wedges, coal power displacement wedges. One is we can build gas instead of coal power plants. Roughly, from that ratio I showed you before, a gas power plant puts out about half as much CO2 for the same amount of electricity. It's a combination of that hydrogen carbon ratio and the fact that gas power plants are more efficient. We don't have to spend so much energy on making it work. So if we had 1,400 gigawatts of natural gas power instead of 1,400 gigawatts of coal power in 2062, by virtue of building a lot of gas power plants in this next 50 years, we would have, we would have had achieved a wage. Now, that amount of natural gas power is immense. It takes 50 li liquid LNG tanker deliveries every day up to the typical today's size. It takes a gas flow of 50 Alaska pipelines. Um, it's an enormous investment in natural gas power, but it's credible that we could do that. And that natural gas will beat coal at that scale. Instead of building 1,400 million tons, of, uh, 1,400 gigawatts of coal between now and then, that will turn into natural gas. It would be worth a wedge. Notably, that's something I've held back saying these words until now, but it's something I personally work on and my colleagues work on, is you don't have to put, so I said a little bit, you don't have to put the CO2 in the atmosphere when you produce electricity by burning a fossil energy source or a biomass energy source. You've got the energy out before you put the CO2 in the atmosphere. The decision to put the CO2 in the garbage pail called the atmosphere instead of somewhere else is a separate decision the decision to make energy from burning something. And so there is a lot of interest in the option of capturing the carbon dioxide at the plant, up the stack, or in some other way. I'll get into that in a moment. 
and then putting the CO2 below ground or turning it into a chemical or something else and not letting it go to the atmosphere. Clearly, if we are going to be burning fossil energy sources for a long time and driving the atmosphere into a very dangerous state, and we have the option instead, without giving up the fossil energy, of putting CO2 below ground to be captured from the planet, that's a pretty interesting option. It raises the cost, of course, by how much compared to what else. And could people be comfortable doing this? Will they have confidence the CO2 will stay below ground? What would a release do? It would be dangerous. My colleagues and I, for the last 10 years, are, are, one of the place, are, are one of the research centers for carbon dioxide capture and storage. The world has a large program right now. Uh, what, does that do to, what does that do if you look back at the combustion process? Yeah, OK, so there are three different ways. Of, well, let me just say, there are two pictures in this. The upper, pic picture, the upper left picture is a power plant in Indiana the Wabash Power Plant, which is a coal gasification power plant built by the Department of Energy money in the late 1990s. It's one of two. The others in Florida that they built at that time. And it burned coal by gasification. And then the gas, the hot gases went to a gas turbine, which is this triangular building over there somewhere. And, and then they, they also went to the combined cycle, which is steam. And that doesn't capture carbon dioxide, but it's well along toward carbon dioxide because you could you have the gas now that has the carbon in it. You could turn the gas into CO2 and run a hydrogen turbine. So hydrogen turbines fit with this story. I don't want to have any carbon burned in the turbine mixed with, if I'm going to burn in air, I'm going to get carbon dioxide mixed up with nitrogen. So I want to put the carbon dioxide out before I burn. And then I burn a hydrogen turbine. That whole scene gives me an opportunity to capture carbon dioxide. The right-hand picture is the carbon dioxide is now in my, in my hands in a, in a pipe. I can put it below ground. And that is a project in Norway where carbon dioxide today is being moved from a natural gas supply on a platform offshore and then put in a second formation. So those two in combination are close to this CCS, carbon capture and storage, option that a number of us have been interested in. If you have 800 gigawatts that is coal power with CCS instead of 800 gigawatts without CCS, assuming 90% captured, not going to have 100% captured, that's a way to so Many of us think that a very important way of getting into the climate the low carbon world is to have carbon capture and storage associated with coal or natural gas power. Question? Is that 800 gigawatts I'm rounding. I'm rounding. No, uh, 800 gigawatts produced before. Um, yeah, that's that's not taking, yes, that's net. That's net. In addition, you're going to have to produce electric power that runs the compressors and things like that. But that's, this is net. Correct. Now, there are three different ways of, that are being discussed, and there are research programs in all of them, and some of you may be, any of you involved with capture and storage in this room? Who, who is? One, two, and then one and a half, and right up and down again. Not very many. But an awful lot of people in the National Energy Technology Lab, uh, which is the coal and gas national lab in Pittsburgh, are working this problem. There are many research groups. And carbon dioxide capture can be done in three different ways. The one I first described is you gasify the coal. You then have a carbon monoxide and hydrogen product, which through a something called a shift reaction can become, with the addition of steam, can become carbon dioxide and hydrogen separate the carbon dioxide and the hydrogen. Then you have hydrogen combustion without a carbon atom. And the carbon dioxide is already separated before you burn it, and then you take it away. Or you have a traditional coal plant, and in the flue gas of a coal plant, 12% of the molecules are carbon dioxide. You go in with a chemical that absorbs that, and there, there are various organic molecules that do that selectively. And so you run the carbon dioxide through a uh, through such a chemical sorbent, you generate the sorbent, and that's called co post combustion capture. The third way, which is going to have all kinds of combustion implications, is you burn in oxygen instead of in air. And your nitrogen is removed before the combustion process. You do something with it, maybe. But the oxygen goes to the flame. It gets too hot. If you have to recirculate something, you could recirculate carbon dioxide. In fact, that's typically what's done. There's a whole project in Germany to 
develop oxy fuel combustion, as it's called. And there's another project planned for the US and the state of Illinois called FutureGen. Burning in oxygen, lots of new questions well, how do, uh, that are involved in that. But it's a third route, because then you've, you've taken the nitrogen out originally, then your, your flue gas is just water based and carbon dioxide, you condense the water and take the carbon dioxide away. So three capture strategies. I've tried to imagine in an article, a separate article in Science of America, which I hope you might, some of you might look at, 2005, called Can We Bury Global Warming? Uh, that we went quantitatively, how much CO2 does a coal plant produce? What sort of volume is occupied down below? If you try to put it there, uh, it's a formidable volume. You obviously have to decide what the height is of the reservoir that you put the thing in and what fraction of the space you can occupy the CO2. But it is, I'm afraid that the last few years we're kind of losing our nerve. A few years ago, people really thought carbon capture and storage was absolutely going to be part of the future of coal and natural gas plants. Now we are discovering that people aren't quite ready to buy the extra cost because they're not worried enough about climate change to do so. But it really could be. With a, with some, if climate change and those monsters behind the door show up um, in the next decade, let's say, it'll, carbon dioxide capture and storage will be back from will come to center stage again. So some of you are actually looking at, might want to look at uh, opportunities to, to think through some of the aspects, technical aspects of this. And it applies to natural gas as well as coal plants. Just because it has half the emissions of a natural gas plant compared to coal plant doesn't mean that half is good enough when we could capture another 90% of that with a natural gas power plant designed to capture CO2. There are several ways of doing that. Then you get competition from, no, from so-called non-carbon energy sources say so-called because there's always some carbon emissions associated with things that happen. Here are four versions, decentralized photovoltaics on rooftops, centralized photovoltaics as such as the university has got uh, a short distance from here, five megawatts of this stuff, wind, which is the growing fastest, and then the so-called solar, therm solar thermal, or con CSP, typical name today, concentrating solar power. Can concentrate in one of this is a trough focusing sunlight on a tube, which is carrying a fluid that gets hot, which is running, you can barely see it, but it's running down the, down the, fo the focus of the parabola that may tilt through the day. And in terms of how much we have, we already have built, and this number I change every every three or four months, this number is going up and up. We have 240 gigawatts of installed wind and 40 gigawatts of installed photovoltaic, all of which has happened. Virtually all of this happened since that paper in 2004. And concentrated solar power, so far very little, but that could come on quite strong. Now they're all out there as real renewable energy power alternatives. Now the word peak is important, because when you buy a, a wind farm or a wind turbine, it's bought and sold in terms of the, what it would make when it's running flat out uh, at a certain wind, with a certain wind speed. But much of the time, wind isn't that strong, and the plant isn't running that well. So we talked about capacity factor, which is the, what you multiply the peak power by, and then by the days of minutes of a year, to see what the output is. The capacity factor for today's nuclear plant is 90%. It's running flat out, short period of maintenance. For wind turbines, their rated power times is about, the capacity factor is in the 20, 30% range. Uh, entirely different. So the, when we compare the, you, you see graphs of the fraction of the capacity of power plants in the country, which are wind for the world, and then the fraction of the kilowatt hours that are wind, they're entirely different by about a factor of three or so. So just to be aware, of the, these are peak power units in both cases, which for all of these are the energy sources, and intermittency, of course, is a big deal. But these are impressive numbers. And Taking a factor of three for intermittency, taking that number 700, multiplied by three, 2,000 gigawatts of, um, of uh, PV producing electricity, backing out coal, would be a wedge. And we're actually 2% of the way there um, at 40 gigawatts. And we're building 40%, with 40% growth rate year after year. These are incredible, incredible numbers for these new entrants. Um, 
and you can get some sense of the order of numbers, what kinds of areas are involved. Much smaller areas than we try to get the concentrate. You're talking about 10 and 20 percent conversion rate. Same number here, same kind of land area, 2 million hectares for a witch, um, assuming a certain efficiency. That's, that's 20,000 square kilometers. It's a small area compared to many other things. For wind, we are all the way up to 12 percent for wedge. We're on track to have a full wedge in the 50 years. It's the only one of the wedges we wrote down, which is really on track at the present time. Wind has come on extremely strong over this period. The, I read the question, are they beautiful? One of the questions that <coughs> affects, affects the subject is, um, is whether the, where these things have to get built. People are pushing them further and further offshore where they don't want to look at them. When your generation say, no, they're beautiful, come on now, build them near us. What kind of an argument is that? It affects the total future of wind power in a very serious way. And then we get to nuclear. Um, roughly one for one, a nuclear plant displaces a coal plant. They, run, they both run flat out. Um, and so you need 700 nuclear plants in the world instead of coal plants create a wedge. Um, we have 350 gigawatts of nuclear right now. So you're talking about twice as much as we have now added to the nuclear fleet while the current ones keep going and those being built instead of coal plants. Of course, if they're built instead of wind turbines, they're not a wedge at all. So it depends on what it's backing out. But 700 gigawatts of nuclear instead of coal is a wedge. Um, if we phase out nuclear and put coal instead, it would be minus a half of it from where we are today. Now, there are a lot of issues here. This particular picture is not a familiar picture to most of you in a nuclear power plant because I'm emphasizing the foreground that somebody else in this picture emphasized that there are these Tootsie Rolls sitting on the squat Tootsie Rolls sitting in the front of this, of this uh, nuclear plant, which are containing a high level waste in, high, in ceramic uh, cylinders, which are holding, holding that power. HVAC went off. 5.30. Okay. Um, and uh, so there's a, this is an solu interim solution for nuclear waste management, which is underrated but happening in the U.S. below the radar, which is it's no longer sitting in the spent fuel pools, which are over, over there somewhere, but in these casks, about three, three per year, and almost more than half of U.S. coal plants are now put, uh, nuclear plants are now putting their waste into dry casks. Fukushima, unfortunately, that's a picture of didn't have its wastes in the dry casks except a very small number. Most of them were sitting in pools, much more available for leakage and creating all kinds of havoc. That picture at the left is Fukushima before the accident. And I want to say that because nuclear, nuclear power is a very controversial alternative to deal with climate change, and it really can, a huge amount has to be used. But wedges, but sorry, casts are a solution for uh, waste management, at least for a half century to a century. And uh, there is no easy solution to the act kind of accident that happened at Fukushima. But I, I want to say this because I'm trying to give you the pluses and minuses of some of these alternatives. Nuclear power has this problem of afterheat. How many of you know what, that, what I'm talking about when I say that? Just a few. In the course of the fission event that produces the heat, that makes the steam, that makes the power, fission fragments are produced, some of which have very fast half, they're almost all radioactive, some of them have very fast half-lives and quickly stabilize. Some of them have slower half-lives and keep on giving heat over and over again. You dump sh when you shut a nuclear power plant off so that fission stops, heat continues to be generated, which has to be removed. And what has, every nuclear plant is designed to remove that heat when during shutdown, like water flow. And the nightmare of the nuclear power industry has always been that you would lose the capacity to remove the heat from the spent fuel uh, because, of, for some reason, the emergency system wasn't going to work. And that has not, had not happened until Fukushima, where an earthquake followed by the drowning of the backup power meant that the power plant itself shut down properly, was tr producing heat that was boiling away any water that was there, and you couldn't add new water were broken or no way could get to it. They had got the engines running to pump the water there. So 
So they have, they have lived through the nightmare that the nuclear industry has been worrying about for 60 years. And it's not over. And this curve just says, what is the percent of the output of the flat out running nuclear plant as a function of time after shutdown for a plant that's been running a fairly long time before you shut it down? And you see that a, a day, 1%. So if you have a 1,000 megawatt electric power plant, that's 3,000 megawatts of thermal energy. That's 30 megawatts of thermal energy produced a day later. 30 megawatts is going to boil water away very quickly if you don't bring the water there. So this Achilles heel of nuclear power, which is the nuclear designers really thought this was never going to happen. And yet they got so complacent that they put back up power in a place where it could be flooded instead of up some, high, some distant high place. Hardened. They didn't harden the backup system. And this is the, an incredibly terrible accident. Um, and then there's the coupling of nuclear power through the fuel cycle, uranium and plutonium, to nuclear weapons, which for many of us, I've worked on this field, my colleagues have the whole, my whole career. Um, can there any, there is in, almost inevitably, when you build nuclear power plant, nuclear weapons smarts that develops, and nuclear weapons materials that become more accessible. You enrich uranium for nuclear power plants. You have um, you enrich to say three to five percent enrichment in the rare isotope U-235. You go all the way to ninety percent. You have a weapons material that same enrichment plant can do the rest of the job. That's an enrichment. Those are centrifuges of an enrichment plant. On the back end, you have plutonium and your spent fuel. You can leave it there, which is called once through once through nuclear power. If you get if you get greedy and want to go after the plutonium, you put plutonium into commerce. This is the French plant at the Hague and they, at La Hague, and they do put uh, nuclear uh, plutonium into commerce. These are very dangerous, and global nuclear power would require that every country, or nearly every country, has a lot of nuclear power instead of coal to make a dent on climate change. We have to have a world where it is safe to have global nuclear power. That is not the case. And so I think the nuclear power option is going to be there. It's going to compete with some of your combustion alternatives, but it has some very serious issues. Accidents, waste management, which I think is the least of the three, and, and uh, coupling to nuclear weapons. So the overall message that I want to leave you with is that um, every solution to climate change, or to oil management, or to anything, has a dark side. And that engineers in particular need to, need to look at issues like that and say, well, what can we do? to make these less severe. Conservation, we could all, if we had 40 mile, a gallon, 40 mile an hour speed limits and maximum sizes of houses, we could have lots of ways in which we could reduce carbon dioxide demand that we don't want to go to. And I'd use the word regimentation to summarize sort of two, two uh, aggressive efficiency. Renewables compete are very land intensive, as we uh, particularly, uh, if they're based on, on photosynthesis, but they all intrude on the land windmills intrude on the land because people, if people don't want to look at them. If they do want to look at them, they're not an intrusion, so it's not quite so simple. Coal to carbon capture and storage is opposed by people who have no problem with carbon capture and storage, but don't want the coal industry to be around because of the terrible record with managing the land nearby, the, the acid, acid water and streams, or the mining accidents. Coal has a terrible reputation. It has nothing to do with the carbon greenhouse oil. And so people say, me would say, you know, we can have coal power into the future with carbon capture and storage and not have an effect on climate change. And the pushback is we don't want coal power no matter what its effect on climate change. So how does that play out? And I've mentioned geoengineering with that. There's going to be discussion of that as another solution to climate change. And it's going to have plenty of controversy because we're basically saying trust the experts will put the climate in order for them. A lot of people don't want to go there. So I call this problem a problem of risk management. We choose targets taking into account both the risks of disruption from the problem itself and the risks of, from the solu so nominal solutions to the problem. Uh, so let me show Mr. Hi Mr. Hippocrates uh, with the Hippocratic Oath to Medicine put in this interesting way, which I think means should speak to engineers. I will apply for the benefit of the sick all measures that are required, avoiding those twin traps of overtreatment and therapeutic meal. Think of a sick patient. There are, certain, there are certain things I shouldn't give that patient. If it's not very, very ill, I want to hold off on a very aggressive medicine with side effects. The more sick the person, the more willing, I'm using, I'm willing to use that. So 
So I'm trying to figure out where does the overtreatment lie. On the other hand, I want to do something. Therapeutic nihilism means nothing works. I have nothing I can do. I wish I could do something. There's nothing for you. Nothing for you. Everything is too dangerous. We don't want to go there either. We've got to find this steer through those two options. And that's a real engineering challenge. So the wedge model was, has been called the iPod of climate change. You <laughs> fill it with your favorite things. You look at those eight slots, eight slots, eight slices there, and you say, well, I'd like to have three of nuclear, thank you, and somebody else says none. So you're going to have your iPod. Somebody else is going to have their iPod. So prepare to negotiate with others. And that's the way this discussion is going to go. You need to, if you're a, a serious about this game, you understand the various positions. You might even be able to help people negotiate. So my concluding thoughts is to say one or two words about population. Um, I don't leave, like leaving that out because it's part of the story. It used to be, let me just do this, it used to be that population was in every environmental and then it stopped happening. People divorced population from the environment. The textbook that John Holden, the science advisor for the president right now, wrote as a young man who called Ecoscience, colon, population, resources, environment. They were linked. They were twins. Now we don't talk about it. But the number of people on the planet does matter. Some of you are interested in, in buying very efficient cars, in recycling. But the most important decision each of you will make in terms of its impact on resources is how many children to have. From a global environmental perspective or a local environmental perspective, it's a very important decision, and yet, the de yet it may not even be in your minds that there's a resource implication of how many children they have. So I tried to find one graph that would kind of sum that up, and it was an astonishing graph to me. Here is three projections from the United Nations about the population at the end of the century, both high, medium, and low, defined by a transition to, a, in the middle case, exactly 2.1 children per mom, which is replacement level, because not all the kids make it. Um, and uh, so that gives you the same population year after year, generation after generation. And it levels out in the US, in the world, to 10 billion people. Cut the number of children per mom by a half a kid to 1.6, and the, and the population peaks at mid-century at about 8 billion people. And it's down to 6 billion by the end of the century falling eight-tenths of a percent per year, giving you a population, if you went another 100 years by that, of about under 3 billion people, without pestilence, without war. Might we like a world which did that? On the other hand, just a half a child more than the norm, we're about 16 billion people at the end, 10 billion difference between one and two and a half and one and a half kids. Uh, clearly, enormous implications of how your generation treats treats decisions about family size, very private decisions. And yet, in my generation, we were incorporating this concern for population and our decisions about family size. Um, it's vanished, but it's got to come back as part of a conversation. There are countries today whose populations are falling, like France. We're paying families to have more kids. From an environmental perspective, you're saying you're bribing people to have bigger families. It's not, it's, it's not right from a climate perspective or from a resource perspective. French society is at stake, and people may get lost, but it's more important to us. But there are, there are serious issues of future population, so how many children you have is an important question. So I have just two slides more. Um, one of the, one, no, a few, four slides. First is to suggest that what I'm really talking about is thinking comprehensively and carefully about the future, future time. And this is new. In my 50 years of being a professional, uh, way back to graduate school, we have learned an incredible amount about the past. In my DNA discoveries, a little early in that, but in the 50s, plate tectonics, how the Earth's the curve, the story of the Earth, the Big Bang being sorted out from other ideas of, about how the planet, the, the universe started. The past has been organized quantitatively, the dating with the help of radioactive dating of what the, the, DNA, the DNA story brought back in terms of what, we really, what evolution really has in detail. We have learned an incredible amount about the past. We try to talk structurally about the future. We have very few skills. We have very little language. We have basically not imagined that we could talk about our collective species destiny. There's a lot in religions about individual futures, heaven and earth 
resurrections, uh, second comings, all kinds of apocalypse, apocalypses and other religions, all kinds of religions have concepts like that. They're all about individual destiny. The idea that we have a destiny on the planet, that we are going to determine ourselves for future generations, that we have a multi-generational project that I'm describing here. That kind of thinking is practically absent until now. You're the first generation which will really be thinking about the collective destiny. What do we want the planet to look like? How do we want it? How do we want to treat poverty? How do we want to treat prosperity? And we can and discussing systematically 50 years versus 500 years. Nuclear waste argument is completely garbled because the only time point that people have is a half life or something, one particular isotope. We don't think about 50 years versus 500 at all sensibly. Uh, this is a work for your generation to do. We have scarcely asked, asked what are we on earth to do. I want to share this thought, which is that we have to be, we have to imagine. We have to imagine a lot that we haven't. Uh, we, we need to. We need to. What this phrase, which this is this, this particular sentence, is stuck in my mind from many many years ago. In order to know the truth, it is necessary to imagine a thousand falsehoods. Don't be afraid of trying new stuff and trying. Well, what if the world did this? What if the world did that? It's never wrong to do that. And that's the exercise that scientists do when they try to figure out what's going on. So I'm still an optimist. The world has a terribly inefficient energy system today. Compared to what we can do with smart, with under the general word smart, all kinds of things are possible to cut, to cut our resource demands. Carbon emissions, we haven't used markets almost at all. There's a small market in Europe that's falling apart. We can bring those sorts of things back and have financial decisions be, in, in, be informed by the the environmental questions. We haven't built globally, we haven't built most of what will be standing in 50 years. A lot of construction which includes power plants and furnaces and buildings and lots of things, tra the transport systems, lots of things that burn stuff, burn fuel, are not in existence yet. We can decide what they will be. And most importantly, many young people, smart and committed, are finding energy problems exciting. You wouldn't be here if you weren't in that group. And that is what is perhaps the most exciting of all. And finally, our planet, is, Earth, is the only one we have. We have to think about our planetary scale, because the problems are on a planetary scale. Our science has discovered threats fairly early. We can identify a myriad of help, helpful technologies. I've given just a short, a few examples today. We have a moral compass. We didn't necessarily have to have one. We do. It tells us to care not only about everyone alive today, to care not only about everyone alive today, but also about the collective future of our species. What has seemed too hard to come to a simple 